Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our 2022 Innovation Lab Law and Technology Demos. If you haven't met me before, I'm Dan Linna. I'm a senior lecturer and the director of Law and Technology Initiatives. I have a joint appointment here in the law school and in the, um, in the engineering school. And my colleague, Chris Hammond and I would like to, to welcome you to the 2022 program. Uh, so uh, before we jump in and uh, tell you about the specific projects and our panelists, I want to tell you just a little bit about the Law and Technology Initiative. Now, first of all, I wanted to encourage you to please join us on social media. Uh, we have a Twitter handle, NLawBizTech, that you can tweet at, and you can use the hashtag NLawCS during, during tonight's uh, presentation. So we encourage you to join the discussion on social media. Uh, this class is part of our Law and Technology Initiative. And when we talk about law and technology, often what people think about is, particularly when law schools are involved, is the law of technology. And we have components of the Law and Technology Initiative that focus on that, thinking about things like trustworthy AI, safe AI, uh, all sorts of questions about how does law keep up in this fast-paced technological world. What we're really focused on tonight is the other side of this, thinking about technology for law. How is technology being used to improve legal services delivery, big law firms and corporate legal departments and legal aid organizations, uh, in court systems, in legal tech startups, and so on. And this is really part of a, a, a partnership across campus and with our external partners. And I'd like to introduce my colleague, Chris Hammond, to tell you a little bit about this initiative across campus and the partnership. Chris? Uh, thanks, Dan, and, uh, and welcome everybody uh, for being here. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, um, yeah, the, the, um, the work, that, the work that, uh, that Dan and I do is really aimed at uh, bringing together um, uh, not just the law school and engineering schools, uh, but to uh, develop a, a, a partnership so that we can also work with um, external partners. And the notion here is that we want to, uh, for the law school students, uh, we want to teach them, uh, we want to teach them uh, enough about what's going on in computer science in particular, uh, engineering in general, but computer science in, in particular, uh, so that they can uh, actually assess uh, uh, how uh, computation is changing the law and what law has to say about uh, computation. Uh, and then on the, uh, on the computer science side, um, we are trying to uh, get our students uh, to understand how to work with people in other fields, um, and in particular in fields where computation is, is, uh, is having an impact, so that they can actually understand uh, the goals and values of the field um, as they are doing development work. Um, and the Innovation Lab, I think, is a, a, is a marvelous uh, example of this, where we bring together, uh, we bring together uh, law school students and computer science students and external partners to work on problems in the law uh, that might have a computational um, um, uh, a set of solutions. Uh, and they learn to work together, to understand each other, uh, to understand um, what can and cannot be done, uh, understand what we want to do and what we don't want to do uh, so that um, when each group goes out in the world, they understand uh, what it means to work with people outside of their point of view, outside of their field. Uh, and uh, today I think is a, is a really, uh, is, a, is, a, is a marvelous example of that uh, with the, uh, the projects that you're going to see, um, which they have worked on uh, for uh, for the law school students for the semester, for the, um, for the computer science students for a quarter and beyond, um, uh, that really aimed at trying to find interesting computational solutions to genuinely pressing problems in the law today. Yeah, and one of, one of the parts then of this initiative is this course, this Innovation Lab course. We also do any uh, other things. And in addition to the strong partnership between law and computer science, there are several other programs and institutes connected with this. Uh, we, we have law students, uh, traditional JD students, and LLM students. We also have Master of Science in Law students who are part of this program. Um, we also have students who are getting master's degrees in computer science, including Masters of Science in Artificial Intelligence uh, students, and a few other programs across campus that are, that are connected. Uh, too many to list all here, but here's just a, a sample of some of those courses. 
some of the things we do are our traditional academic conferences as well. And um, some of you have been to those, like the, the Law and Computation Symposium that we did uh, last year. And we're looking forward to putting on a larger conference again this fall around some of these uh, some, some of these topics. And so in the Innovation Lab itself, we bring together these computer science students and these law students. And a really important component of this is these partnerships with our external organizations who bring real problems to us. Uh, and Professor Hammond and I uh, get, introduce uh, some agile scrum development methods for the students to use as a, as a, me as a method for self-organizing and working with their, their project partners in the Innovation Lab. And so this year, we ended up working on five different projects. Uh, we, we worked with the, the LexShift team on a project on omnibus legislation review. We worked with the Mayor Brown law firm on contract clause search and review. We worked with the McGuire Woods law firm on M&A transaction management. Uh, we had a project internal here to Northwestern where we worked with the Northwestern Institute for Augmented Intelligence and Medicine on health data sharing enabled by computable contracts. Uh, and we worked with Thomson Reuters on a project on extracting and classifying information from court dockets and evaluating classifications for bias. So now, before we uh, go any further, one of the things we've been doing for the last several years is having a panel of experts who can take in these presentations, uh, demos, right? These are, these are not just presentations, they're demos. They're gonna really do live demonstrations of the things that they've built. And uh, so we've got an, an outstanding panel of experts here with us tonight. And I'd like to ask each of them to, to take a minute just to tell us about kind of where they are, what they're doing, what, what took them there and, and uh, their interest in this program on, on, on innovation tonight. But Kunur, Kunur Chopra, can you please kick things off by just telling us a bit about, about yourself? Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Great to be here and very excited to see these demos. So I'm an attorney in California, based in Southern California, and I'm the vice president of legal services and also a co-founder at a company called Elevate. So many of you may have heard of alternative legal service providers. We refer to ourselves as a law company, but really bringing a solution of legal support services and legal services to law departments and law firms to, imp to improve efficiency. And the reason that I ended up where I am is I actually practiced for five years as a litigator and just saw a lot of inefficiency and in how law firms were, were operating as well as how they were supporting their, their corporate customers and thought, you know, I, you know, I need to change this. And so started one of the pioneering companies in 2004 um, to bring efficiency to legal, which back then was labor arbitrage, sold my company and fast forward to today, we have demos like what you're gonna show today, which are focused on really improving how legal work is done and managed. So uh, looking forward to being here and, um, and seeing what you all have to offer. Awesome, thank you, Kunur. Irina, Irina Matviva, can you introduce yourself, please? Yes, thank you. So I am a Chief of Data Science and AI at Reveal. So we are a software company. We're building an e-discovery platform and we say we are all in on AI. It's an AI powered e-discovery platform. So I've been in this space for almost 10 years now. My background is in computer science. I have my PhD from the University of Chicago and I've been studying and researching kind of applying machine learning to text. And this is legal is one of them. I think wonderful area, very exciting and challenging areas of application of that. So we have a lot of AI technologies in our platform. So that's um, uh, that's kind of what, what we are doing. And I'm also an adjunct professor at IIT. I'm teaching data mining. So I'm very excited. I'm looking forward to all the presentations and thank you. Great, thank you, Irina. Nick, Nick Long, can you introduce yourself please? Sure. Uh, I'm Nick Long. I'm a managing director in the legal business services practice at uh, Deloitte. Um, like Knur, I am an attorney by background. I spent about uh, 19 years as a practicing attorney in the M&A space. Uh, I spent a few years after that uh, still in the law firm environment on an operations and innovation role. And then I recently moved over to Deloitte about three months ago, um, much as Knur said about improving efficiency. I, I saw I was on the corporate side, but much as she saw the inefficiency and in how uh, legal delivers its services, I saw that on the M&A side, uh, and I'm really excited to be at Deloitte to help build out that support practice. Um, I've been, Dan, I've been involved with this for what, three or four years now? Uh, yes. I, I remember that picture actually that you showed. So uh, really excited to be back here. I know we presented a project with you guys a few years ago, and now really excited to be back as, uh, as a judge on the panel. 
Awesome. Thank you, Nick. Okay, and we're really excited then to get uh, commentary from our expert panelists throughout the, the program. The questions they're going to ask the, the students to answer after they, de they demo their projects. This so is just a little bit more on the format. So each team has eight minutes to demo uh, their, their project. They're going to set it up with just a brief presentation and then jump into their demo. No, have about eight or 10 minutes for questions from the expert panel. Uh, I'd encourage others, if you want to drop questions in the chat, that, that's perfectly fine. Maybe the, the experts or the students will pick them up or others will pick them up. We encourage you to use the chat to exchange messages with, with each other, or share links, whatever, whatever you'd like to do, right? Uh, the chat's open, uh, so, so please don't hesitate to use it. Uh, so one of our teams won't be presenting tonight. The Thomson Reuters team is not going to present. And I just wanted to, to recognize the, the Thomson Reuters project partners and thank them for, for working with us on this project. This is actually a carryover of a bit from a project that we worked on last year. Uh, but, but thank you to Rachel Bython, uh, Don Seffer, and John Hudzina at Thomson Reuters. We've been working with them for a while now, and we look forward to continuing to, to work with them. So the agenda, uh, we're gonna jump in now with the presentations here in, in just one minute. Uh, the Northwestern team is gonna go first, and then we'll go to Mayor Brown, McGuire Woods, and then the Lex Schiff team. And then we'll just ask for some closing comments from our expert panelists. Uh, and each round of, of uh, uh, demos, I'm gonna ask one of the experts to go first after that round. And then I'll just kind of, hopefully they'll be able to jump in and start asking questions and the students will, will respond to those questions. And finally, again, I just encourage you to, to join the discussion on social media, uh, send out some tweets, use the hashtag uh, NLawCS, whether you're on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or, or wherever, you, wherever you might be. Uh, and then one last reminder for any of the students who joined later on, I know some of you have classes and stuff at, at this time, time, but make sure that I've elevated you to co-host right now so that you can share your screen and, and unmute, right? And just send me a direct message if that hasn't happened. Uh, but with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn things over to our Northwestern Medicine team. Take it away, team. Well, we can go, again, go ahead and get started. Thank you, Professor Lynn and Professor Hammond for the warm introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today we'll present our product in collaboration with the Western Institute for Artificial Intelligence and Medicine, Table Transfer. Through this project, we hope to be able to expedite the transfer of data required for health research. Next slide, please. So here's a somewhat of a general overview of the current data sharing process and some of the stakeholders that are involved. Um, the main stakeholder that we're going to focus on today is going to be the third party researcher. This person, this person is unaffiliated with Northwestern, but wants to access data from Northwestern, from our, ED, from our enterprise data warehouse through the office sponsored research. The office sponsored research includes data stewards, institutional review board, and the general counsel. However, sometimes the third party researcher may not know exactly how the data is structured and what should and should not be shared from that specific data set due to, thing, due to things like HIPAA complications and so forth, so on and so forth. And because expectations are not always clear for the stakeholders, there may be issues that come up and come into play. Next slide, please. And that brings us to the problem that we're trying to address. So now that you kind of understand some of the process into what goes into kind of these data sharing agreements, um, the issue that comes from this is that when we generate data use agreements um, and we're trying to categorize these large amounts of data, um, we have to go through multiple steps between each of our stakeholders to make sure that, they, that the data we're sharing is appropriate and meets the standards that we're trying to share. For example, whether it includes fully identified data or de-identified data. However, these repeated iterations between distinct stakeholders um, and the data sharing agreement generation process that has to continuously be re redone can cause errors and miscommunication. And unfortunately, this, this causes stalls in um, the drafting of the final data sharing agreement. And to achieve this, usually it might take anywhere from six months to one year to be able to actually get the research and the data into the hands of the third party researcher. Next slide, please. So now why does this matter? This matters because stalled research means stalled progress and a lack of innovation in healthcare. Next slide, please. Thus, how are we trying to solve this? Our product solved this problem um, uh, by creating somewhat of a software that streamlines the data sharing process, saving stakeholders valuable time and increasing product uh, progress and innovation for healthcare research. Through this, we hope to make the process crisp, clean, and more verifiable. 
So our product's primary user is going to be a Northwestern University healthcare researcher, and this user will be wanting to share data with a third party entity. Next. So in phase one, the primary user will be completing an introductionary questionnaire, and the product algorithm uses the 18 HIPAA identifiers to label the data as being either fully identified, de-identified, or a limited data set. Additionally, our product uh, brings value by removing ambiguity and clarifying any additional protections based on the data type. At the same time that the primary user completes the product questionnaire, the algorithm then populates and drafts the data sharing agreement, and this drafted agreement is then reviewed by the Office of Sponsor Research, modified as need be, and sent over to the third party legal research team. Next. So uh, phase two picks up with the third party legal research team. After they go ahead and sign the agreement, it is returned to the Northwestern University Office of Sponsored Research. And now the uh, Northwestern University data steward can receive a copy of all the questionnaire results. And from that, uh, he or she can craft the data bundle and send it over to the hands of the third party researcher. Now I'll be uh, showing you the demo. So this is the questionnaire form that will be filled out by the researcher who wants to share the data. So let's suppose I am a researcher and I want to share data with the professor team at MIT. So I'll be I'll begin by filling the details such as RB number of the data set, recipient name, address, uh, investigator name, uh, and the name of the database that I want to share. It could be a profit or non-profit institution. And these are the data types that I will uh, want to share with the with professor team. So here you can see that I can, uh, let's say I want to uh, share all the dates, all the demographic data and some of the test results. And when I hit submit here, a data sharing agreement will be generated. And in this agreement, you can see that the fields have already been uh, populated uh, by the details that we filled in the questionnaire form. You can see the recipient name, the address, and uh, here you can see based on the selection that I made in the questionnaire form, the data has been classified as a fully identified clinical data. And also the categories of the data has been uh, filled here. Now, uh, let's see how the data agreement changes when I uh, remove some of the uh, HIPAA identifiers. Let's say I remove the dates and demographic data and only include the city, town, and keep the test results. And when I hit submit, uh, you will see that the data has been categorized as a limited clinical data. And now when I remove all the HIPAA identifiers, uh, here I, I will re remove city, town, then, and when I hit submit, you'll see that the data has been categorized as a de-identified clinical data. So this is how the data sh uh, sharing agreement changes according to the selections from the questionnaire form. Yes. All right, great. So we believe some subsequent iterations of this project could explore integration into the enterprise data warehouse, like putting data in one space to increase the taxonomy. That same data will need some security, which will require maybe a multi-factor authentication and some sort of encryption. And then for our user experience, Enhancements could include like lifetime progress tracking to highlight the data that's in transit, as well as making patients aware of the data that's being shared. Now, lastly, what's not listed here is the additional legal analysis that will need to be explored, expanding beyond the current jurisdiction to more applicable states. Finally, we wanted to introduce you all to the team behind this project. As Professor Lina and Professor Hammond stated, we come from a different backgrounds, a variety of different backgrounds, including the MSL program, computer science students, as well as law school students. And on our last, on our last note, we would like to extend our gratitude to our project partners from the Institute for Augmented Intelligence, 
in the Northwestern Feinberg School of Medicine. And uh, we definitely look forward to the opportunity to expand upon our current moving, moving past our work within the confines of the Innovation Lab course uh, with a continued partnership with our project partners. Thank you. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you, Northwestern Medicine team. All right, I'm gonna turn things over to Kunur, Irina, and Nick for questions now. Um, Kunur, do you wanna kick us off maybe with the, the first question and then we'll let others jump in from there? Sure, thank you so much for that demo. Um, so first of all, I like that you obviously started with the problem to be problem to be solved and from there looked at, you know, kind of what the overall solution should be. I guess a couple of questions that I had were one, um, kind of what 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 research have you done to see kind of what exists in the market? So where, you know, to come up with this as an opportunity. So where was there any other technology or any other solution that addressed this type of um, a need? Um, and then, you know, what did you do any kind of research around or, or kind of number crunching on what the ROI of this type of a technology and solution would be? You can answer okay, either or both. I, or... <laughs> I can go ahead and answer the first one at least. Um, so when we were doing our research, and again, uh, contract drafting and uh, is not really new to the medicine field. Or, well, not even medicine, just the in fields in general. Um, even through our presentations, that you'll see further on contract drafting exists, and even um, companies like Ironclad uh, that are based in Illinois, like they they also use contract drafting. And so it's not exactly a new concept. The issue that comes with data sharing agreements and their drafting comes with this like this process that we have to keep going through to make sure that we're meeting these HIPAA requirements and make sure that we're act we're actually sh accurately sh uh, sharing our data. Um, that's kind of what made it a little bit different, um, at least with our, the conversation with our project partners. Um, we saw that this was a space that definitely needed to be expanded upon. Um, I, we hope that this is not just a sole project on ourselves, that we aren't just novel individuals picking this up, that there are individuals out there that are continuing to do this. And I think with the advancements of contract drafting, especially in the spaces um, with machine learning and uh, natural, natural, uh, natural language processing, this could be expanded on very heavily. And uh, again, as we see with the work with across many fields, this is something that's quite promising and could benefit the, the field of medicine and research a lot. Yes, as for the uh, ROI, I don't really have exact figures to give you at the moment, but it is something that certainly came up in our final meeting with our project partners, and it's certainly something we're looking uh, we're looking into as we move beyond the innovation lab course and seeing how the product can be further expanded upon and fine tuned to provide even um, increased value in the market. Okay, thank you. A somewhat related question is: Is the Northwestern research project process? unique or is this scalable to other you know any other research institution basically this can certainly be scalable to other research institutions just uh, i guess maybe one thing in the way our product would uh, differ from those in other jurisdictions would be at least with those pro uh, protections that are specific for sharing of men uh, mental health data Data and I believe uh, genetic counseling data. So of course we'd have to go in and fine tune and ensure um, that we build in flags for those additional protections in distinct jurisdictions as need be. And of course, maybe in the future, um, providing direct links to each institution's um, EDW. That is one handicap we had since as students, we weren't able to actually access the EDW and see the data itself. But um, it's definitely something that could be expanded upon or uh, someone with HIPAA training. That is something that they could take on and build into the product. And just on the EDW point, is the idea that ultimately that this software package would link directly with that and self pull the data? Is that what you're trying to get to is like an auto extraction? That would be ideal. Yes. And okay. it could also link like even just uh, like the protocol name to the uh, the data set number, the IRB number it's designated in the warehouse so that it could go through and complete that additional scan automatically to ensure that everything checks up. Okay. Yeah, Rina, sorry, Devon. Oh, no. Go ahead. Sorry. So, so my question is about um, kind of the the application of technology, and so I know from my experience, at least, and it's a, obviously a huge uh, area of uh, discussion and research in the in the community is the transparency and explainability of technology, right? In the broader sense, did your partner did they ask about any like exp explanation of why, say, your approach? Um, chose particular uh, termination if it's like highly sensitive data or like not not a sensitive data. 
And it's kind of as a follow up almost, did you consider having like a human in the loop, right? Do you have a process to double check the results or maybe QC at least some of the results? Uh, so I think our CS students, uh, either me through or Olivia, would be able to better answer your first question. But uh, to answer your uh, second question, um, this this is kind of used not to uh, eliminate the uh, the presence of humans, but to kind of uh, aid them in kind of uh, creating this process, of allowing it to be more efficient. Um, ideally, this whatever data sharing agreement is drafted, the reason that we chose it to be a Word document is just so it could be augmented, it could be mm -hmm. fixed by people who would uh, who would have inevitably checked this. So again. Uh, um, one of our stakeholders, the private office sponsored research, they might be the ones to actually go ahead and check this um, data sharing agreement, make sure everything's up to snuff and make sure they everything checks out on their end. And in case of the mental health um, uh, portions and stuff and genetic counseling data, th those require additional documents. So even regardless of whether like the, the final document is checked or not, for those specific things, those definitely need to be checked and because they require additional data need to be bundled within some kind of agreement that is sent forth to the third party researcher. So again, the, uh, they will be part of the loop. They, um, this only attempts to make their, uh, their work a little bit more efficient. And that's I actually see. why we decided uh, that the output should be in the form of a Word document as opposed to a PDF. So that way it grants those in the Office of Sponsored Research the flexibility to add any additional clauses especially since right now our product is uh, built around one basic template, but maybe in the future we could uh, include uh, maybe like um, four templates, so to speak, like one that's more tailored to fully identified, the identified, and the other two a limited data set and so on, because the clauses can change a little bit. So that would just, uh, that would simplify their lives to an even greater extent. I see. I was just going to add one point from a, um, First of all, I love, I should have mentioned this earlier. I think the product's great. I love the idea of kind of streamlining what is a complicated process using automation. Um, the one experience I've had with automation though is when you have the number of fields to enter that you guys have had, um, you might want to limit them in some way. So, you know, where you're asking for like a study number, you know, someone could easily mistype that and it's going to screw up your entire workflow. Um, so, you know, whether you can pre-populate that by linking to a database so they have to select something specific, but anything you can do to kind of minimize the amount of human input that has to be typed in, I think would stream would make the product that much more useful in the end and minimize that kind of need for, for a gut check. Sorry, Rina, if I cut you off. Oh, no, no, no worries. No, I, I agree with you. That, that's a great idea. And uh, just an, maybe as a suggestion um, to what I said earlier, if you can, because you show that then that clause, the actual wording changes depending on the fields which are selected. So maybe like in my mind, like if you hover over and you can see like, why is it highly sensitive what fields were selected? So then it's kind of a way for, for a human reviewer to get like an That's insight, right? So then they may um, uh, trust it more. Yeah. So that's, uh, I don't know. Or if even it like came a glossary, up your... like a question mark that you could hover yeah, over as to exactly. why this is relevant. Um, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a great idea. Yeah. Uh, Mita, would you mind sharing your, the slides one more time and go to the last slide? So um, to answer, to answer uh, Ms. Serena's question about like how we kind of chose this data, um, the kind of uh, guidelines for whether um, something is de-identified or uh, clinical or fully uh, or somewhat or, um, mm -hmm. like fully identified data is all somewhat set out. And these are some of kind of the, um, the outlines that we're kind of looking at. So whether it includes um, these specific factors is how we kind of uh, can the, the algorithm decides whether it's fully identified data or not. And again, this is expanded into de-identified and fully de-identified data. Um, so using these kind of ideas, this is kind of um, how we kind of categorize things. Okay. And we do somewhat um, list it at the end, but I do agree that it would be nice to have those kind of like question markings that we can hover over to see that. I think that's definitely a, a, uh, an inclusion that we want, that we will keep in mind for the future. Okay, okay. And last clar clarification question, but when you say algorithm, do you have like a set of, it's a rule base? Is it a rule based system or is it is, is this the system learning? Um, from, from your input? So, so the algorithm is a rule based learning based on the uh, boxes that is, we select, the data types, the algorithm will match those types uh, from the 18 uh, HIPAA identifiers mm -hmm. and then classify the data as a fully identified limited or uh, de-identified data. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. That's great, and the demo was very nice. Thank you so much. Okay, any additional questions from Kunur, uh, Irina, or Nick? Okay, nice job. Nice job, Northwestern Medicine team. Thank you very much. You know, I, I should clarify too um, that, you know, in, in part because we're partnering with external organizations, we haven't spent a lot of time with the teams getting them to think about like this being a startup class, right? Now, some of the different project teams have thought more about that, that, wow, there might be an opportunity here to, <laughs> that this is a, we could create a viable product here. Uh, but we've been really focused on the problem that external companies, uh, external organizations, the partner organizations bring to us and uh, they're important problems to those organizations. We've been working those problems. And some of the projects that required us to do more work, kind of like seeing what other solutions are out there and learn about the marketplace um, and, and think about potent startup potential, but not every one of the teams was there a lot of, uh, of emphasis on that, just, just as background for kind of the context for some of the teams. Uh, so thank you, Northwestern team, Northwestern Medicine team. And now we'll turn things over to the Mayor Brown team. The floor is yours. Awesome. So good afternoon, everyone. We are the Mayor Brown Group, and I want to thank you guys for taking the time to spend with us today. Our product is called Closet. It is designed to help attorneys who are drafting agreements. So once upon a time, there was a junior attorney in Chicago named Dan. It's 5 p.m. on a Friday, and he's ready to head home after a long week of work. But alas, a more senior attorney approaches him with some last minute work to do. He says, hey, Dan, I need you to draft a fee letter for Big Bank. I emailed you a recent one to work from with the client's preferred language. Make sure to add a new clause for administrative agency fee, but it's due today before the close of business on the West Coast. Okay, bye. Dan would like to use this previous fee letter provided to him from his partner, but he may not be able to do that. Let's see what's in store for Dan today. Okay, let's take a step back. Lawyers spend a lot of time drafting documents. It says seldom start from scratch and often start from a precedent document. However, an attorney still faces a challenge. Does the precedent use the client's preferred language? Maybe it was a part of a one of deal with unique language. An attorney cannot know that by just looking at one document because it lacks history and context. Our project focuses on this problem in the context of bill letters. Fee letter is a particular type of agreement that contains various fees in a loan. The law firm's client is a bank or lender. Let's go back to Dan. How is he going to assess if this current draft is okay to use? Uh, most of the time, the client's preference is tantamount to the most commonly used language in their past fee letters. However, there is no data on language use frequency collected generally. To ascertain the most common language, Dan must lo manually locate and review past fee letters. This required a, requires a tedious deep dive into the firm's document management system using a text-based search to find fee letters from the same client with the same type of fees. Then Dan must manually, manually review each clause in each fee letter. All the while, he tries to get a quantitative sense for what language is preferred. This process is inefficient and error prone. We have created a solution to improve this drafting process. It's called Closet. It's a clause use tracking tool. Closet is a word add-in that gives the attorney clause use data directly in their working environment. No more labor intensive document searches are needed. The information Dan needs is right at his fingertips. With minimal work, clause data is automatically captured as attorneys draft and finalize fee letters. This clause data enables the attorney to find the best language for the current fee letter. By using Closet's quantitative data, the attorney can quickly check if the current draft is abnormal or is using the client's preferred language. This makes Dan's drafting process much more pleasant and accurate. And uh, my colleague, Jonathan, will show you how it works. Hi. Uh, before we get started, I just want to recap exactly what we're going to be doing. We're going to be checking to make sure that the language for the current clauses in this document are correct. That's going to be for the upfront fee and the facility extension fee. 
We're also going to be adding an additional clause in the form of the administrative account fee, I believe it was. Now, to do this, we're going to be doing something very simple. We're going to select a clause. And using the compare clause tool, we're going to access our database and find all the other instances where this bank has used an upfront fee. And using this highlighting, we can see that there is a matching fee, right? One that is identical, that's already in the database and it's been used most frequently as this whole bar is sorted by frequency. Now with this, Dan can be pretty confident that the upfront fee he has in the document is in fact the one he should be using. It's one which is both most common and very frequent and very recent. So having seen this, Dan can move on, can go over to the facility extension fee, perform the same action. Now, in this case, he notices that although he has a match, right, a fee which has been used before, it's not the most commonly used one. So Dan might think in this situation that this fee is in fact a one-off. And if that's the case, he might not want to use that. He's much more likely to want to use the most common terminology and the most common clause. Now, it's as simple as replacing the current clause. And as you can see, the clause has been repopulated in the, in the Word document. You can make any adjustments to formatting and modify the clause just as you would any other Word document. And really, this is the power here. Right? You get all the same functionality in Word and you ignore all of the hassle and the time it takes to access the data, uh, document management system. Dan doesn't need to go searching through you know, 15 files to make sure that he's using the right clauses. And he can do all of this very confidently and very quickly. Now let's move on to the last thing Dan needs to do before he can go home. He needs to add one more fee. Now, Dan's partner sent him this fee, and he said the client wants this fee included in future iterations of these documents and all future fee letters. So Dan can put this document in, move over to the clause registration section, select his clause. And it just so happens that another document has also been using an administrative agency fee. And just like that, that clause is all of a sudden registered to the document. Now with that, every future attorney that needs to do work with this company will similarly be able to access all the same information they were able to access for the previous fees for this fee, right? They will be able to get that huge plethora of functionality and convenience thanks to Dan's couple little keystrokes and click. Now, this is really powerful and I think it can radically increase the efficiency of any attorney working on documents like these. Now I'm gonna pass, pass it over back to uh, my colleagues here. We showed how Dan can use Closet today. So let's talk about how Dan can use this in the future. With future updates, the solution can be even more useful. First, historical clause data can be analyzed proactively, generate firm-wide insights about fee letters. For example, if the market has shifted and most banks are charging 10% more for a particular fee, the tool can flag that for an attorney so they can advise their client banks. Second, Closet can be used with documents other than fee letters. By identifying clauses within the document, a computer will be able to track the changes and the entire transaction over time. So we want to just take a moment to thank our project partners, Jordan, Jacob, and Anna, who have been integral in helping us navigate through this project. But also thank you to my team members, Heidi, John, Jade, who am I, Kai, May, and Nick. Um, and we are the Mayor Brown team and open for questions. Okay, nice job, Mayor Brown team. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. Okay, uh, Irina, Nick, and Kunur. Uh, Nick, do you want to go ahead and kick us off uh, this round? Sure. Um, nice job, guys. I think uh, 
one of the initial things you said is uh, one of the things I'm most impressed with, which is the idea of parking this right in Word. Um, one of the things that we talk about whenever we're trying to introduce legal tech is meet people where they live. And you've done exactly that by, by inserting this directly into a Word plugin. So not, really nice job on that. Um, one of my first questions is, um, how did you guys land on fee letters? I could see a lot of applications for a piece of software like this. And I'm just curious why, um, how you landed on fee letters as a kind of trial case. Um, it, it, truthfully, it was a function of, the, of our uh, project partners who um, the, the attorney, Jacob, that we work with, did a lot of work on that. And we felt mm -hmm. that it, um, it provided sort of like a small enough universe to, I don't know, it kept the project a little, like, like you're saying, it, this is sort of agnostic, the type of document, right? It's just sort of like clauses in a contract, but just mm -hmm. focusing on one type of document just kind of kept our, um, kept us anchored a little bit and kept the problem manageable in the you know, amount of weeks that we just did for this class project. Okay. That, uh, no, to, that's... to add to that, uh, there's actually nothing in the plugin right now that is specific to fee letters. It is already compatible with any other document as far as I'm aware. Okay. That's good to know. Um, one, one question about the, the functionality of it. So the, the way you were doing the demo on the screen, it was kind of a clause by clause analysis. Is that manually or is that physically how someone would do it? Or is there a way that you could get that feedback on, you know, at the entire document at once? So clause one would, you know, get a green check because it's frequently used. Clause two would get maybe a yellow check because it's only the second most popular. Um, I'm just thinking from, a, from an efficiency standpoint, do you have to click clause by clause or is there a way to kind of, kind of streamline that? Uh, at the moment, we are clause by clause because I think it was important to stick with the granular functionality that would work for every single case. And then we can always expand on that with other features that can improve the quality of life from there. Right? Mm -hmm. We wanted to make sure that our partners had all the functionality they needed before we gave them, you know, bits and pieces of functionality that together might not create a whole picture. Okay. Sorry, I don't wanna ask all the questions. Kunur or Irina. Um, sure, happy to jump in. Um, yeah, thank you for the demo. And I like the way that you guys um, shared the problem statement. That's a good way for it to kind of click and resonate with people. Um, a couple questions I have. One is, um, what kind of testing did you do to ensure that the right information was captured as you were you know, on the right side where, where you were showing the different types of clauses? So what kind of testing to make sure that was done? And then my second question is, how are you capturing variations in language? So, I mean, it, it looked like it had to be kind of exact, right? Upfront fee versus, I mean, this wouldn't be exact, but you know, if it said retainer versus retention fee. So how are you, how are you gonna account for variations in language versus, ex versus um, uh, exact words? So with regard to the highlighting of differences inside the text, at the moment, it's a very simplistic method, right? We're comparing two strings as simply as it gets. Um, that is definitely one of the areas we intend to improve in the future. Um, you know, in the, in the scope of the time we had for this project, we couldn't, we couldn't make every feature, you know, amazing. We needed to have every feature in place with room for improvement. So definitely that's one of the areas we're looking to improve on in this, in this, uh, in this program. Um, with regards to the categorization and uh, titles of clauses, um, when we spoke to our partners, we understood that the clauses they deal with are relatively consistent. So we could expect to have, you know, any, any fees which fall under the same umbrella to actually be named the same thing. Um, this, is, this is what I understood at the very least. Um, there isn't a lot of uh, carryover, but we do we do have the functionality to show kind of an autocomplete system, which allows you to see you know what is already in the database. So when you're registering clauses, you might detect that oh, there's already something like this, or this fee already exists in the database, and so it is somewhat up to the user to maintain some consistency. But we give them some tools to do that. Got it. 
Yeah, and that makes sense for, for this specific type of agreement where there probably could, there's consistency around how, how fees are named. But as you look at kind of the future, right, you have that slide of, hey, where do we go from here and other types of agreements, um, you'll start to not see as much consistency. And so, but the beauty of it is you have technology, there's AI, right, and all the different ways of, of applying it um, to be able to address uh, variations in language. So um, thank you. Irina? Oh, Irina, I don't know if you're, um, you having trouble with your microphone or? Uh, I'll ask another question while she's, while she's uh, figuring that out. Um, is it, would you need a separate instance of this for, you know, let's say um, Chase as a client and B of A as a client and uh, RBC as a client, would you need a separate instance of this for each of those clients or how would that work if, you know, poor Dan had a fee letter for multiple lenders on a Friday afternoon? So if, if Dan is working across multiple companies, at the moment we have it set up so that Dan will get information relevant to the company he's working on. This is, I think the idea here is kind of start off with the assumption of keeping things relatively separate. Mm -hmm. right? To bring things together is easy to pull things apart, sometimes a little more difficult. So we started off with an eye towards, you know, maintaining a clean separation. Um, one of the features we're looking to integrate is an optional kind of expansion to these searches, right? Things that would allow you to look at clauses that are across multiple companies. Um, so I think this is what you meant. Uh, if so we do definitely have an eye towards that right now. No, I mean, the, the fact that you're pulling, so in my uh, Chase example, your search would be for Chase documents as opposed to a B of A. Okay, that's that's a good way to handle it. Um, okay. Okay, now my audio is on. <laughs> um, I like the presentation. I like the idea. So it's uh, like the previous presentations, like an MVP, right? So there is a lot of room for improvement, but it's it's a great it's a great demo. It's a great idea. And um, I, I like that you actually approached it um, on a smaller scale, like maybe with individual clauses and not the whole document uh, at the, kind of as a whole, because like, you know, very often like a smaller, more focused uh, approaches work better. So that, that, that I, I, I kind of liked it in, in your approach. Um, my question is, it, it is a real time search right, that you're performing, did you see any, like, any lag and any time issues? Or do you anticipate they might come up as your bank of clauses grows larger? Um, I would suspect that the area which would have the most delay is probably in the compare clauses. Um, because, you know, it has to do the highlighting. It's a little more complicated than our search function, which just returns those unique clauses. Um, and, you know, finding unique clauses itself can be an intensive thing, but I, I think that's something that can be managed by future changes to, to the way the database is structured if we run into issues like that. Um, but we also, right now, we have the benefit that it's small, right? So we get a lot of functionality out of being able to kind of get that very granular view and, you know, keeping things very, very granular for, for the sake of demos and early use case. All right, thank you. Uh, one quick last question. Um, it seems like you guys are using frequency as a proxy for um, accuracy or correctness. Um, but if in a situation where, you know, I'm the evil partner on a Friday afternoon and I say, you know, Chase has just dictated a new provision that we have to include, or Chase wants this particular provision. If it's different from the precedent, you would get an error hit, right? Or a non, a non-consistent. Yeah. So how do you yeah. solve for that? 
one so one night we we sort of talked about one one possible approach to that is um which i don't think it's implemented is right having multiple having multiple options for sorting like one sort of data point that could help in that situation is like looking at recency right like yes if it's the most frequent but it hasn't been used in like two years right mm -hmm. then that little signal it tells you um but even i think in the product now like um you know just adding like metadata to these clauses could maybe help address that things like i don't know even something as simple as this is the current standard language and like having a yeah. filter based on that right there's all sorts of things you can do um but yeah we, the metadata tagging would probably be the easiest but yeah um, but yeah we, we just sort of went like you're saying with the yeah as a proxy for like okay okay i'm done we already have a fair bit of metadata metadata tagging for clauses um we didn't go into it into the demo for time's sake, but it's already uh, part of the registration process. If you want to use it, it's optional. Got it. Okay, great, great job, Mayor Brown team. Good questions, good discussion. Really appreciate that. Um, I love having this discussion. I love the fact we've got law students and technologists in the room who are thinking about all the ways in which we can improve the way we draft contracts, right? There's so many opportunities in this space, a really exciting uh, conversation about thinking about, uh, you know, the, the mindset change that's required to attack these problems and think about how we can do it better. Uh, so very exciting. All right, now let's turn things over to the McGuire Woods team. McGuire Woods team, the floor is yours. Hello, I'm Katie Nagley, and we're Team Checkmate, an MA checklist management tool. The problem we are looking at is that buying and selling large companies is a complex business that law is critical to. These merger and acquisition transactions involve a lot of different people, both within the law firm that's representing one party, such as specialists reviewing the documents, the law firm representing the other party and other professionals like accountants and investment bankers working on the transaction. These tasks all have different timelines before signing, during signing, before closing and post-closing items. Because there are severe consequences if deadlines are missed, being hyper-organized is extremely important to the legal team handling the transactions. Most transactions are managed by a closing checklist or several closing checklists that contain essential tasks, documents, dates, and signatories that attorneys need to keep track of. I'm gonna hand it off to Adia to tell you more about the current state and issues that could be solved through technology. Thanks, Katie. So the current problem is that manually creating closing checklists and word documents eats a valuable time, which can cost clients a significant amount of money. We wanna ensure that associates are accurately handling a lot of information when manually looking at and sorting through a variety of documents. Even worse, this cost is further driven up by repeatedly adjusting the checklist anytime the details of the deal change. It is extremely important for checklists to be accurate in order to avoid missing any key task, which could result in the deal not closing on time or at all for that matter. If a key obligation or filing is missed, this can lead to significant financial and legal ramifications. So what if there was a tool that automates some of these tasks and automatically generates a closing checklist? That's where Checkmate comes in. Now that we've talked about the problem, let's talk about the intended user for this product. So this product is intended for associates who help manage M&A deals. Essentially, lots of things need to get done in such a short span of time when dealing with these kinds of matters. Given the current state, an associate would transcribe closing deliverables from the agreement or pull from the memory of the deal and put it directly onto the checklist. The user has to search a variety of documents, read a 60 to 80 page purchase agreement, identify tasks that need to be managed, add these tasks onto a task list, and manage several other components by an extremely strict deadline. The high stress, the crazy deadlines and the never ending search for various documents and emails can be really intense. The technology built here is designed and geared towards associates handling the task of such deals. Overall, the ultimate user is the, the law firm, McGuire Woods. They want to improve accuracy and efficiency. This tool improves accuracy through automation, reduces billable hours on repetitive tasks, and reduces the workload on already stretched associates. Now, Z will hop into our solution. So after we researched 
on the checklist and spoke to the attorney at McGuire Woods who used checklists in different ways to ideate on ways transaction management can be improved, we came up our solution, the check, uh, Checkmate. And it's a software to automate and augment the menu review of the documents and populate the closing checklist with uh, required documents and signatures. And the software includes a mechan mechanism for attorneys to quickly pop populate with variety of items, uh, such as who's responsible for the task and the due dates and its status. So as Adia said, uh, the automation of the closing checklist process will provide a great value to the clients and McGuire's uh, working on high value commercial mergers and acquisitions. Um, and Checkmate is up applicable to any transaction type. And um, our tool is uh, built imagining a future where technology is able to analyze deal documents and communications and uh, present information to uh, attorneys that helps them uh, successfully execute the deal while devoting more of their time and expertise to high value tasks. Now, uh, Max and Mason are gonna show the demo. So we will jump right into the demo. And so this is Checkmate. And as you can see, Checkmate utilizes both user input and an upload of the actual purchase agreement to uh, create a closing checklist that can be, has information that can be saved and modified. And so some of the parameters that are sometimes difficult to find on the purchase agreement itself, are the agreement type, the sign and close type, uh, both the signing and closing date are sometimes difficult to be found, uh, buyer, seller, buyer's counsel, and seller's counsel. And so this information is inputted by the user. And as you can see in this instance, the agreement type is an asset purchase agreement. Sign and close type is bifurcated, which means the signing date and closing date is different. It doesn't occur at the same time. Uh, and in this case, the buyer will call, call them Wildcat Equity Partners. The seller is Chicago Home Health because uh, this is made for the healthcare segment of McGuire Woods, but can be utilized by everyone. And then the buyer's council is McGuire Woods and the seller's council is Winston. And so in the tool, as you can see, you can go ahead and just upload a purchase agreement. So we'll find a purchase agreement, put that in, and then we can get him. We'll just hit submit and I'll pass it over to Mason who will describe the output of the program. Yeah, thank you, Max. So as you can see, it lists a list of checklist items that are generated from using the form as well as using purchase agreement. So first of all, the tool uses information from the form as a starting point to populate the checklist with items that are almost always on checklists not for all deals or for deals that are using the attributes from the previous form. So closing deliverables, as you see below, is an area that the checklists that are deal specific. So these are items that will be pulled from purchase agreements. And how that's done is the tool compiles the list of the library of closing deliverables from a set of checklist items and purchase agreements. The user uploads the purchase disagreement and the tool conducts rigid searches on the document for those specific items. And once you find those items, it inputs it here uh, so that your attorneys can see what are those specific items that can be pulled out. If a closing delivery was found, as it be associated with a buyer or seller or buyer counsel or seller counsel as part of the library, it will add those responsible parties at the second column. As well as for the other items, they also kind of have these responsible parties that are associated with each item as well as the signatories. And if you look to the, to the right, each item has a complete status. This way that attorneys, once these items are completed, they can mark them as complete. And all the attorneys will be up to date on the progress of each of these items. And I'll hand it back to Max to talk through how these purchase agreement items are pulled out. So as you can see, the first uh, closing deliverable that was inputted from the purchase agreement is the payoff letters for each item of debt to be paid at closing. And so essentially the way our program works is this is a, a redacted purchase agreement given to us by McGuire Woods. If we'll just control F for payoff, as you can see in the other closing date deliveries section, uh, our program finds that one, the item one is payoff letters for each item of the debt group companies to be paid off at closing. So our program notices this, but then subsequently enters it into the checklist. Now I'll pass it to Michael to talk about some future developments for our program. Thank you, Max. Um, so the current state of Checkmate is a really great starting point for attorneys, but we definitely think that there are ways to scale this project and be even more ambitious. So we built this tool off a very small 
sample set of purchase agreements and checklists. And because there can be a very uh, a lot of variability in purchase agreement structure and, and the language that they use, we'd like to expand the tool uh, so that it can work on a much broader set of purchase agreements. Uh, another thing we'd like to implement is actually the use of machine learning to learn from uh, attorney feedback so that the tool gets better at reading purchase agreements over time and makes more accurate suggestions for checklist items just based on uh, previous attorney behavior. Another high value area uh, that we would love to add is adding functionality to the tool so that it automatically updates the checklist as the purchase agreement is updated. So in essence, these deals are very heavily negotiated and both sides at the negotiating table will frequently suggest changes or even additions to the deal as it progresses. And this means that the purchase agreement is a living document that changes over time. And we'd actually like the program to be able to reflect these changes without additional user input that takes up even more attorney time. So this would obviously save attorneys time um, because they don't have to go back and double check different versions, versions of the purchase agreement so, uh, to see what has been changed um, every time the document is updated. And now um, I will just give a quick overview of the team that worked on this. On the law student side, we have Katie Nagley, a third year JD MBA candidate graduating in the class of 2022. Uh, myself and Adia Brantley are JD candidates graduating in the class of 2023. And Sheha is an MSL candidate graduating in the class of 2022. On the computer science side, we have Mason Lynn and Max Ward, um, who are both computer science majors at Northwestern University. And obviously we would like to give a huge thank you uh, to the McGuire Woods team for devoting their time, um, obviously um, extremely valuable time and providing the various materials and documents that we needed, as well as helping us to better understand our client needs, uh, helping us to develop the application with their feedback and giving us very, very uh, specific feedback to actually improve the functionality. So thank you everybody. And thank you for um, coming to our presentation. All right. Thank you. Nice job. Thank you, McGuire Woods team. All right. Uh, Irina, would you like to kick off the, the questions this time? Sure, sure. Thank you. So thanks a lot for the presentation. That, that's great. Um, I like that it's um, you position it very nicely. It solves an actual problem, def definitely, but definitely very complex problem. I think it's, it's a very challenging uh, thing that you're trying to tackle there. Um, so my, my question is, um, you, and, and I liked that you, it seemed you worked with subject matter experts. Right, to, you understood the process, how they go through the process and try to uh, make improvements to that using technology. So that, that's great. Um, but I wanted to clarify, you mentioned that there are a lot of repetitive tasks, right? D during the m and process and creation of the checklist, but then uh, how do they, do the attorneys start from scratch every single time or do they reuse some of the checklists? So. That, that was not clear to me, but I, will, I want you to clarify if you have like any templates you could um, use as well as a starting point. Yeah, thank you, Irina. Um, so part of our process was actually um, having calls with different McGuire Woods attorneys, uh, both junior attorneys and partners and asking them how they actually um, solve this problem right now without our product. Some of them would try to find a close template for a similar deal. Um, that seemed to be the most common way to approach the problem. And uh, I believe one or two actually um, tried to create a template uh, or to create a new checklist from a template that they used for uh, from scratch, essentially. So that's kind of the starting point that we had. And that gave us an idea of where we could take the product to save them time based on what they currently do. I see. And that checklist, I wasn't sure, can they modify it? Because you present a number of items, but they, can they insert items or delete items from the checklist so, that you generate? So uh, as part of the MVP, that's not one of the functionalities we've built in okay. right now, but definitely that's one of the things that we've envisioned uh, is, yes, the attorneys can go ahead and take those checklists and go ahead and make edits that they want to use as well as kind of export it to Word document to use it as your existing workflow, things like that. So definitely part of our further improvements to be made. Okay. And and did you, 
compare the results of the checklists that uh, were automatically generated against the checklists that attorneys actually did create for previous cases? Did you have like yeah. a baseline that you tried to match? Yeah, I think we do. Uh, we did look at kind of uh, the checklist to base off of to see if we can get as many of those items as possible. So kind of uh, what we tried to pull out items, there were some missing, uh, missing one, including the W2, but um, that's kind of something that we can actively work on and improve the accuracy of. But uh, many of the important items are there and that's kind of our MVP. Okay. And did you talk to the attorneys, what is more important for them, like recall or precision? Like, do they know, did, did you, did you um, have that conversation? Well, I think like you say, if you miss, if you miss one of the items on the checklist, how critical is that? I, I think the biggest takeaway was that almost all, if not virtually all the items are critical. So um, precision was um, the most important element, if, I, if I'm understanding the distinction there. Um, and as Adia mentioned, obviously missing one of these items could stall the deal or actually just have it completely collapse. So the biggest thing for us was being as inclusive as possible with um, what the program actually captures to make sure that um, we'd rather have false positives than missed positives, if that makes sense. I see. Yes, yes, that makes sense. Thank you. And then I guess like one question that's more out of curiosity, you see, you mentioned that like in the, for, in the payoff clause, then the program notices that there are some uh, details about that. Like, what do you mean by that? How, how exactly does it, does it notice that something important is happening there? So um, the way we do it is we have um, a list of items that we know could pop up in purchase agreements. So we kind of make that library as, mar as large as we can based on the information that we have. And within each document, we kind of basically look for e each of these items through a reject search of the entire PDF document uh, that you've uploaded. And if it finds it, it would add the item. So that's how it's basically done. I see, I see, thank you. Thank you, that makes sense, thank you. I, I just have one question. So kind of related to what um, was, uh, Irina was asking, but how did you, obviously, you, you know, you upload the document, you're, you're testing what it's, what's being found against that checklist. How did you test the accuracy of that to make sure? And how long, like, how long did it take you to get to that point of, okay, once we're, we're confident that what's being uploaded is being reflected accurately in this checklist, because then you want to make sure that obviously that checklist reflects um, the critical um, obligations. Yeah, I think I can answer um, that question to an extent, then obviously I'm happy to pass it off to the computer science team. But one of the things we were very attentive to is the possibility that the regular expression um, parameters would um, flag uses of certain terms that um, have multiple meanings. So for example, consents is a noun that can refer to a deliverable item, but also in a lot of these agreements, you have language saying this party consents to send X, Y, Z. And so what we had to do is kind of refine the parameters or include um, a larger phrase to actually make sure that um, we were getting the right deliverables instead of getting those false positives. So that's one of the ways we tested to see if um, we were capturing uh, the right language. And so and then how accurate do you feel the technology is right now with respect to capturing the right information in the checklist? Because you want to be able to rely on that checklist, right? And so how accurate? Yeah. Um, we definitely think it's extremely accurate for the um, database that we built off. And again, we want it to be extremely safe so as not to um, you know, have a deal stall on um, the back of uh, you know, missing a, a crucial item. So we definitely think um, based on the, the types of purchase agreements that we looked at. Um, if you were to upload those purchase agreements, again, you will get um, a, a very successful um, results from however many times you run the program. Okay, and just as you kind of move forward with any of these types of technologies, it's important to make sure that you get to a point where, I mean, like when we look at kind of what's out in the market, it's, you know, people are talking about, you know, even 98% accuracy isn't good enough, right? Because if you miss that, that one, um, 
that one obligation. So that's really critical. And I know Irina has spoken about kind of human in the loop. Um, obviously there's some of that at the testing phase and some of that even in an ongoing basis even mm -hmm. when you have technology that's pulling information out that there's a certain level of QC to make sure that it is where it needs to be where you're capturing the right information and you're not missing things. So um, technology is great, um, but it's even with technologies out that's in the market. Not bulletproof. Right? It's not bulletproof. It's not 100% where it needs to be. So you definitely need that human in the loop or some level of QC. Um, but thank you. Thank you. It was a great question as well. So I lived this hell for 19 years. So how much time do you have to go through uh, to go through my questions? Um, no, kidding aside, um, I'm going to ask a question Kanura asked early on, which was, did you guys, when presented with this problem, do any kind of market research to see what what is out there on the market to see who's doing this already? Uh, yeah, absolutely. That was one of the uh, things we actually picked up on very quickly. And we found that there were some products that were similar, but not exactly what our client was looking for. Um, okay. So for example, one, uh, one example that I remember we looked at in class together is Legatix, which actually lets you uh, create closing checklists yep. um, automatically. But we noticed that they didn't seem to have that kind of language reading function or as good a language reading function. Yeah, I was just going to say, the, so I, I'm, I know most of the products on the market that do this. And what, what is interesting about yours that is a distinguisher is just that is I know they can all generate checklists, but I've never seen one that actually gut checks it against the, or not gut checks, but actually runs it against the purchase agreement. So that is that is a bit of a game changer piece of um, functionality that I haven't seen before. Um, but in terms of other functionality, um, you know, the, that example that you used of the payoff letters, right? Like, yes, that is in fact a closing deliverable. There's no question that those have to be done, but that doesn't actually tell you what you need to check off, right? There could be a payoff letter from Chase. There could be a payoff letter from B of A. There could be a payoff letter from, you know, pick your other lender. You know, I've seen transactions where there are like six or 10 payoff letters. So I, I'm curious how, if, if the checklist isn't editable, how you're generating or how you would propose to generate something that could actually be checked off as opposed to just saying, did we get the payoff letters? Yes or no, because you wouldn't know if you actually had the full universe. Uh, again, I'm happy to answer this question, but what we were focusing on essentially is making a product that could capture um, the language as broadly as possible so as to not avoid um, certain items that need to be delivered. Mm -hmm. One of the things we do want to do um, in the future with it is actually incorporate machine learning. And, and perhaps one of the things we could use machine learning for is kind of be able to better understand from the text of the agreement the specifics of each item. So as you mentioned, the payoff letters maybe have a specific um, number of payoff letters and who the payoff, leaders, uh, pay payoff letters need to be sent um, to specifically, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, and at the moment, I think what um, our current iteration, what we had in mind for our current iteration was to have an attorney that could just sift through the checklist and be able to identify key um, deliverables that they need to get on with, and then they could cross-reference cross with the purchase agreement as it is to find the specifics of each task. Um, so it's a good I idea. I'd just... like to add something also. Oh, sure. um, so my goal is that we discuss the possibility of the tool also reading from schedules and exhibits to get like additional details beyond what's in the body of the purchase agreement. So that's something that we were interested in adding to the roadmap of the tool and something else that's not there now that we were interested is implementing it more as a human in the loop system where it potentially suggested payoff letters and then allowed for the attorney to input more information and then put that language into the checklist instead of right now where it just pulls the information and puts it in its base form in the checklist. Yeah, Catherine, that's a great idea, because what I was going to say is that you wouldn't find the lender's names in the purchase agreement itself. You would find them in the schedules, or even if you could cross-reference this with a data site, that would be amazing, but uh, that's probably a ways off. But um, but if you could cross-reference the schedules, you would find those that information there and pull that information in. And then, you know, if you could edit it, I think that's important, because otherwise, you'd effectively have to have two checklists. You'd have your main one that you guys generated, 
and then your second checklist off to the side that had the specific lenders' names, and then you're kind of defeating the purpose of, of having that single point of access. Um, the one other question that I wanted to ask about functionality is, it, it appears to me that this was intended for kind of internal McGuire Woods use only. Is, is there an idea of sharing this across? Because one of, the, one, of the, one of the functions that other tools have is that it's, uh, it's a universal checklist that buyer's council, seller's council, investment banks, everyone can see and you know, see where things are and who's doing what, what's done, what isn't done. And so did you guys talk about that, that sharing function of this at all? Yeah, so um, we definitely discussed this, um, the, the possibility of kind of sharing the, the use. Uh, just to, to ask a clarifying question, are, are you talking about potentially sharing the tool as a function for other users um, in a more broader sense than McGuire Woods team? Yeah, so, you know, Magu in, in your case, McGuire Woods was buyer's counsel, Winston was seller's mm -hmm. counsel, right? Winston and McGuire Woods would both have access so that in real time, you know, I could go in as Winston and check off the fact that I gave you the payoff letter, or you could go in and check off that the other payoff letter was received or something like that. So more of an interactive nature to it, because um, mm -hmm. otherwise people are swapping back, you know, Winston's going to keep their own checklist, McGuire Woods is going to keep their own checklist, never the twain shall meet. And that in and of itself can cause some strife. So if you could consolidate that, so everyone's working off the same list, you know, you're achieving that original goal of kind of streamlining the transaction process. Definitely. Um, and I appreciated the literature re reference as well. Um, so our, our entire aim for this product was actually to, to be able to hand it over to McGuire Woods to integrate it into its own um, either website or cloud um, system for different attorneys within McGuire Woods to actually uh, work on. And if that's something that, you know, McGuire Woods um, wants to implement in terms of sharing it with different counsel that um, they're negotiating agreements with, um, we definitely think that there's a possibility for that because the checklist is, um, you know, self-functional. We, we didn't rely on kind of McGuire Woods back and informa or information or tech solutions, if that makes sense. So um, we designed this product with them in mind, and we think that if they want to scale it in that way, there's definitely mm -hmm. room to do that for sure. Okay. Yeah, and in the tech side as well, there's definitely built in that that enables that them to extend this functionality. Right now, uh, like having that database already, they can definitely extend that to be persistent within McGuire Woods and the seller council. So that functionality can definitely be extended. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and, and oh, so, ahead, sorry, I have as I have like one one more comment is a uh, I like that you plan to make it a more an interactive checklist because I think like everybody's comments are it most likely will not be hundred percent correct right which is okay we use technology but that we have to also understand it will not be hundred percent correct and we kind of it built it into the product almost right and then so one of the maybe suggestions is that. When you extract information from somewhere, maybe purchase agreements or like in those schedules, you can link, the items can link to the documents where they came from. So then again, the human can QC double check, maybe extend if needed. It, it, it's funny, Irina, that was one of the main ideas that we spent um, yeah. a lot of time discussing is being able to link back to the specific language in the purchase agreement. I think in the conversations that we had um, with the professors, um, they encouraged us to kind of focus on getting the core elements of the product um, nailed down and, and really airtight, and then hopefully be able to expand on that by adding features like that, which we agree could be really, really helpful for attorneys. Okay. All right. Thank you, McGuire Woods team. Thanks for the demo. Thanks for the questions, Irina, Nick, and Knur. All right. Uh, one last team, Lex Shift team. The floor is yours. Hello, everybody. We are thrilled to present Omnibuster, software designed to bust open Omnibus bills and make them more readable and manageable for attorneys and other legal professionals. Omnibus legislation presents a myriad of obligations and opportunities for attorneys and clients alike, but also comes with a slew of problems. These bills are often hundreds, if not thousands of pages long, and contain countless internal and external cross-references. When bills are newly enrolled, 
Attorneys and consultants cannot afford to wait for others to process what cascading effects the bill will have on current law. Omnibuster enables legal professionals to quickly and efficiently perform a comprehensive review of novel legislation, saving time and cost for themselves and their clients. If you are a lawyer at, say, a small law firm that needs to review a large piece of legislation, such as the CARES Act, there are about three different formats you can use. For example, you can use PDF, but P the PDF version is limiting. Legislation has many external references to US laws that need to be referenced, but there's no mechanism for accessing any of those references. As you can see here, just on the first page of the CARES Act alone, there are six different external references. And in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, there are more than 2,700 references, both internal and external in the whole document. Additionally, because of the bill's large size and length, attorneys or consultants will often take a divide and conquer approach to processing bills implications, but um, the different tools that allow the users to annotate and markup PDFs don't have an integrated collaboration environment. Another format that could be used is the XML format. Uh, the first thing to note that this XML version read in a browser is more visually pleasing, but some readers uh, process like the um, the like how they read things differently, so it might be better just to have toggleable aspects to the formatting. Um, another uh, thing that you should know is that the XML provides some link to the external U.S. codes, but you'll note that um, many of the internal def uh, um, references, such as to definitions and the external references to public laws and the Code of Federal Regulations, are still in plain text. Um, you'll also note that the XML loads as a single file, which uh, may load slowly and is more cumbersome to scroll through, but there, and there are also no annotation or collaboration features. There's also a plain text version that loads in a browser, as you'll see on the bottom right here. But I want now to introduce the USLM XML schema, or United States Legislative Markup. Behind the curtain of the plain version that loads into a browser, when a bill reaches enrolled status, the Government Publishing Office, or GPO, packs a lot of information into the file, as you'll see in the background of this slide. For example, document structure and information on relative pathways to external references, along with linkages to internal terms. Simply accessing this USLM file directly in, the, in a browser does not solve the clear hurdles Vivian identified in using the PDF or XML versions, but a tool leveraging the information encoded in USLM could be extremely valuable to those practitioners seeking more efficient and rapid understanding. We've highlighted a number of problems current formats create for users. We saw opportunity in the fact that current tools don't integrate all the functionality you'll see in a minute during our demo in a single package to enable processing of large bills. I'll hand it over now to Divya, Sadie, and Rory. We can't control how Congress drafts, but we can make it easier for practitioners to figure out what omnibus bills mean for their clients. Meet Omnibuster. Now we're going to demo our solution. So the Omnibuster's user interface is designed to mimic the document formats we're familiar with working with, but the added benefit comes from the backend tools we've built to parse the raw files provided by the government to significantly improve their usability. When you arrive at the landing page, you're prompted to upload the bill you're interested in working with. We provided detailed instructions illustrating how and where to get the correct files. Generally, this process looks like going to govinfo.org and finding the USLM XML file for the bill you want. Alternatively, however, through GPO's API, we've been able to provide a work in progress demo allowing users to search for the desired bill directly from our website, sidestepping going to govinfo.org, downloading, then uploading. But for now, let's get back to the original functionality. After uploading the bill, the parser goes to work. Right now, our parser is applying formatting, adding links to externally cross-referenced doc documents like the US code, and setting up other helpful features like highlighting and annotation capabilities. This process can take a little while for large legislation, but it only needs to happen once. After that, your load times for content will be nearly instantaneous. What you're looking at now is the homepage or the table of contents for the act, for the act I uploaded, which is the CARES Act. The layout of this page makes understanding how this massive piece of legislation impacts my clients much more digestible. To demonstrate this, let's get started at the top of the definition section. One of the many features Omnibuster has to offer is its ability to recognize internally defined terms throughout the document. This can be cumbersome to look up separately, but here as I read, I'm able to directly reference these definitions. For today, we've implemented an illustration of this functionality. 
Once I wanna dig into the substance of the bill, the first obstacle that I reach, as Vivian talked you through, is the fact that there are plenty of external references. Remember, some of these large bills have thousands of these, and you need to navigate to each of these external references in order to fully understand the implications of the text. Omnibuster removes the burden of having to search for each and every one of these and choosing a reliably up-to-date source. We direct you consistently to the same version of both the US code, for example, directly linking you to this section, and the Code of Federal Regulations. Again, linking you directly to the section you're interested in working at. As I'm reading through the bill, I can highlight any section that I don't want to lose track of on the page. And if I decide I wanna make a note, I can go ahead and add that as well. If I've read something and wanna go back and make a note about something I've read previously, oops, I'm on the go. I can do that and I've got all my notes directly available to me. We've also added op optional user visit, optional usability features. For example, these sidebars are fully optional, but for those that like them, they help to orient you to the location you're at in the bill. Say I'm knees deep in a section and it references a previously sub part of that section. I wanna be able to scroll up without accidentally returning to a section prior. These sidebars help with that. Additional, an additional um, breadcrumb further helps to do that. And I can continue working through the bill, each and every section, making these notes. And as Divya will talk you through, we've got additional features to make this even better. Yeah. So we also have some features that are currently in our product backlog. Based on various conversations with our stakeholders, we put them on the back burner during our semester, but we think that they would add value to the product in future iterations. The first is the landing page that Sadie showed earlier. This version pulls files directly from the GPO website, and so the benefit of this is that it streamlines the process for users by eliminating the step of having to download the file separately. Additionally, we also uh, want to focus more on the features that facilitate knowledge capture and sharing. So we have preliminary versions of annotations and internal hover definitions, and we would continue to make those fleshed out and persistent in order for users to have all of that information at their fingertips. We also want to have collapsible sections and active breadcrumbs um, that make the bill even more easily navigable, and also add in collaboration and sharing to allow users to share and split up their work. All that to say, from here, there are a whole host of directions that we could take Omnibuster. And this is our team, uh, two JDs, two MSLs, and two CS students. And to highlight a huge win, uh, please join me in congratulating Roy Fitzpatrick, who we just learned 20 minutes ago was selected as the MSL program's student speaker for our graduation next month. So Roy, you rock. Um, moving on, uh, uh, collaborators, even beyond uh, Sergio and professors Linda and Hammond of the Innovation Lab, uh, we had the support of an entire village to develop this product, and we're grateful for a handful of external partners' time and advice. Uh, thank you to Jeff from Lexshift and Vishal from Nelson and Bird for their support throughout the course, and Jeff especially for many hours of brainstorming, software engineering collaboration, his broad strategic initiative, and the access he gave us to additional advisors at Guidehouse, Fastcase, and Copars. Something to note is that Omnibuster's future development might lead to automated extraction of defined terms from within statutes, or even retrieval of definitions referenced in other sources. Uh, uh, with presentation to users via pop-ups. Jacob Beckerman and his Copars team do this effectively already with contracts. We highly recommend checking out Copars if uh, you haven't seen it already. Uh, also worth expressing is our gratitude to Lisa and John at GPO, Government Publishing Office, for taking the time to engage with us on USLM, the Government Gov Info API, and more. When bills cross the President's desk, the GPO team does the hard work of ensuring bills are accessible over the web for the public, and the bulk data task force efforts to modernize the public's access to legislative processes is truly promising. Thank you for your time. We can answer questions and are eager for your feedback and ideas. Thank you. Okay, thank you, LexShift team. All right, nice demo, thank you very much. All right, Kanur, would you like to kick things off again? Sure, absolutely. Um, thank you, it was a great presentation. I like the visuals. Um, 
uh, 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 that you showed. A uh, question I had is, I know in the beginning you mentioned that you did your market research and looked at um, other technologies that, that were out there. So what was the differentiator um, in Omnibuster compared to the others? Yeah, the biggest thing is that it integrates a lot of what some other uh, tools do in a single package. Um, like you'll look at Cornell's uh, Legal Information Institute, that site, uh, they have, you're able to scroll between sections, you're able to see a, a lot a lot of the law, uh, but number one, there's nothing there's nothing on Cornell's LI for uh, large omnibus bills uh, and also no collaboration or, or uh, uh, collaboration or, or environment tools. Um, otherwise, uh, yeah, just nothing really for, for large bills specifically, uh, we integrated it all together. Okay. Another question. I don't know if this would be on the roadmap, but like you said, it's it's a lot of information. Um, even even with where you have it, right, to sift through and review, um, would you get to a point where through through AI um, you can actually get to to summaries of the information? So is that something that's kind of on the roadmap or even possible? I think we would envision that as like a step beyond the next steps. The first step we would we would want to do is enable knowledge sharing across collaborations. As Divya talked about, uh, I make my own notes by manually, and then I can share that with other people in the firm, they can add notes. So that's the first step. Once you've developed those notes, you've got a much more robust corpus of things that you can potentially train things on to extract information, but that is a large challenge. It's yeah. maybe somewhere down yeah, the future, yeah. depending on which direction you take it, but the, the step prior to that is just knowledge sharing about yeah. the bill. Yeah, knowledge sharing is critical. So um, I think that's important to have, to have that level of collaboration. So thank you. Irina or Nick? Sure, I'll go. Um, this isn't even the type of law I practice, but I have to tell you, I love this product. Um, I think the, it's really well thought out and designed. Um, when you were first showing the demo and there were those colored lines on the side of the screen, I have to admit I was horribly distracted. But now that I understand what you're trying to do with them, it makes perfect sense. And I actually think it's a great idea, not just for omnibus bills, but kind of like any kind of legislation because they're always formatted like this. So I don't know who thought that one up, but that was that was a really great idea. Yeah, um, we give Jeff, uh, Jeff a lot of credit for a lot. And, and that's something that uh, we'll give him credit for too. He, he's, he's a reasonably intelligent guy. I know him well. Um, uh, one comment about the hyperlinking, you know, I, I think it's a great idea to give you that context to be able to bounce back and forth because there's so many of these cross references. Um, but one thing I'm curious if you guys thought of to kind of enhance the efficiency is if you looked at some of the examples where you included a hyperlink, if you go back in the sentence, it actually refers to a subsection of what you're hyperlinking to. And I'm not even sure how feasible this would be but to actually make that subsection the hyperlink as opposed to the main statute hyperlink, um, just something to think about, but you, you know, just to save an extra couple minutes of, of reviewing through a document. So just something else to think about. Um, and then I don't know if you guys even contemplated something like this, but a lot of what you were showing on the screen talked about um, amending an existing statute, right? So section A is amended by adding the following, right? And so what you're looking at is an addition without context. And what I'm wondering is if you guys considered the possibility of showing a version of, you know, whatever they're adding section A to it, showing that text with the new language added, so you'd have full context of what the amendment was doing. Is that something you considered? Is that feasible? Am I out of my mind? So uh, uh, GPO is doing a lot of great work. I am the first person who will be uh, skeptical of any kind of time frame involved with anything related to government, but uh, they do have something kind of in the works to, to do that, to, to essentially um, redline different versions of bills as they're in development. Uh, so we, we kind of, once we learned that, didn't really think too, too much about working it in, but uh, potentially something coming down the road. I, I think they're slated to, to push that out to congressional offices later this year, knock on wood. Interesting. Another, I will, I will add to what Nick said, another interesting concept that we sort of discovered there was a need for in market research is 
sort of an ability to redline the US code such that you can identify sections that don't link directly back to a particular type of um, particular piece of legislation, which I think is sort of what you're getting at. Like, mm -hmm. I want to be able to look at things in the context of the US code, but I want to specifically look at the things that come from, say, the CARES Act. Right. How can I how can I link portions of the US code to a particular piece of legislation? So there's right. certainly a market for that. It's a it's a challenging task, but it's it we do sort of think Omnibuster fits into a part of that problem. Yeah. In the future, um, in future iterations. Going to the very start of your question, uh, I at least looked into this for Cornell's version of the US code, and you can directly link to subsections, nothing mm -hmm. beyond that. So no subparts or items or anything within that. Um, and it's not perfect. It actually, when you use that link, it starts with the actual like first line of the subsection cut off at the top of the screen, but it is something possible and, and wouldn't be too difficult to implement. Okay. Okay, thanks. Irene? Yeah, so thanks a lot, a great presentation. Um, I like your use of the agile language. <laughs> I think that's, that's great. Uh, then mentioned at the beginning, but you guys really showed it off a little bit. And um, I like that it's a, the problem is, like we, you, you use something which is available, right? So that the kind of the markup language is available and you're solving this a very, I think it's a very important problem, right? It's a lot of like the improved readability, I think by many orders of magnitude. Um, so my question is, so my, my understanding is you process, oh, and I like the name, the Omnibuster. <laughs> That's Frank gets really credit name. for that one. <laughs> um, so, but then, so, you you have the references which um, link like which are kind of uh, references to pieces of legislation legislation, but have you thought about processing the, those pieces of legislation as well, so to speak, because they probably also have references, right? It's probably like a, a little bit uh, uh, recursive process, right? Have you thought about that? Maybe create like a bank of everything which is processed with your tool, so that when new pieces of legislation link to that people have the same um, improved uh, experience of reading those documents. It's, it's one of those things, it's a very interesting idea, but it's a challenge that grows exponentially, which I'm sure, I'm sure you've already touched on. It was certainly not something we were thinking about for the scope of this course. And I think yeah. it's something that would depend on the direction you take Omnibuster. You, there's, we've sort of built this platform that you, we think you could build out in multiple different directions. And depending on which direction you take it, I think would determine whether there was a need for that or whether we were filling some other gap in the market. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? And did you use, well, you, I don't know if you had time, any user studies? actually like A-B testing, like was D that improved readability and by how much? Now we, we, we had some, uh, we ran it by some project partners and, and got feedback mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and, we, and we incorporated feedback uh, as we iterated on the product, but uh, not extensive uh, market uh, user testing at this point. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I mean, for example, those sidebars are toggleable because Jeff said he liked them and then somebody else came back to us and said, they're distracting, I don't want them, so. That was the, the ability with yeah, whatever yeah, yeah. market research. Exactly, but it's great, right? It's exactly the approach to take, yeah. All right, thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you, LexShift team. Okay, great project, great, great discussion. All right, well, I just wanna take, a, we're gonna take a couple of few minutes here to wrap up the event. I wanna give the, our expert panelists a chance to uh, provide some comments and, and, and let Professor Hammond jump in too before we, we close things out. Uh, but uh, you know, I think I think the students and, and, and our audience would love to hear uh, from Kanur, Irina, and, and Nick your thoughts. Kind of, I mean, what are you seeing happening in the world? Uh, we're hoping that we're we're graduating lawyers and and other legal professionals, uh, legal engineers, data scientists, legal operations folks, and and technologists to go out and work in law firms, legal departments, legal aid organizations. And we're hoping that this experience is something that's going to help prepare them for that. Um, no, we'd love to hear what, you know, what are your thoughts on what you saw here today and, and how you think they can contribute to what's happening in the world. Uh, Kunur, you want to kick things off? 
Yeah, first of all, I think, um, great job to everyone, but I think one of the things that stands out to me is the collaboration amongst you know people from different backgrounds and people who are pursuing different degrees, right? And I think that's what you're going to see. So one of the things you know we look at, I mean, in companies like mine, I mean, I'm an attorney, but and in our company, we have attorneys and you know data scientists and and you know people with computer you know science background, like people financial backgrounds, people with varying backgrounds, but we're all coming together to solve you know, a challenge or challenges for a common customer. And that's what you all have done here. And by by bringing together these different backgrounds, where right? we talked about the, the T-shaped professional, you, you've really come up with some interesting and innovative ideas and ways to then address different functionality, right? So, you know, Nick, as you're saying, hey, you know, we give that credit to, you know, this, this person, and that's because, you know, different people from different backgrounds, that diversity, right? The diversity of backgrounds um, is bringing, um, uh, great ideas to to creating these um, solutions. So that that stood out to me, I'd say the most, and I love that. And I think that is what will be key to your success as you go out. So not just, even if you're an attorney working at a law firm, don't just stick to that, right? Hey, how can I collaborate with people from different backgrounds to come up with a solution? Because being that smart lawyer is not going to be enough and is not going to really take you to that next level and, and showcase your talent. So I think that's critical. So I guess I, I'll, I'll actually stop there because I think that's very important um, to take out into the world is that type of collaboration. Thank you, Kaiwa. Well, absolutely second everything Kanur just said. I mean, that's spot on. I'm not gonna even belabor the point. It's just well said. The other thing uh, the, that I would add is, you know, for, for decades, people have talked about how law as a profession is so slow to change. And what I saw in every one of these presentations today was, taking a problem, taking it apart and thinking about it in a completely different way by incorporating, you know, the computer science folks, by incorporating the, the master's in law folks and getting those teams together to look at a problem differently. So it's a, it's a similar theme to what Kanur was saying, but that, that kind of fresh approach to doing things is one of the reasons I really love this program is because it's not teaching people to just be lawyers, but to be open thinkers and to, to, to tackle the challenges, the many challenges that this profession has in a completely new way. So, you know, hats off to you, hats off to all the, the participants and to, uh, to Chris and Dan for running such a great program. And I was not paid to say that. Thanks, Nick. Uh, Irina? Yes, I also agree that that kind of this interdisciplinary collaboration is one of the like really uh, wonderful points here. And uh, I see it kind of from my own experience, like me coming from the computer science background, learning about the legal space, about the e-discovery. It just opens up, you know, like interesting ways to apply technology and really creates like a level of appreciation of what our users are, are going through in their daily work. So I think that's very important and vice versa. I see that uh, lawyers, attorneys who are our clients who understand technology on a deeper level, they are much more willing to use technology and they're much more innovative like from what I can observe. So I think it's really benefits both sides. And uh, we, all, we often say that to, to be successful, you need a great technology Technology, you need uh, data and you need a subject matter expertise. And again, in these projects, you kind of bring all these three pieces together. And I think it's another wonderful thing. Um, and I also love that it has this entrepreneurial idea to that, right? So these are like all little startups and there's a little product and projects which can go grow and uh, you know benefit your users, which is I think a wonderful thing. So yes, thank you so much. Good job, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Irina. Uh, Chris, Professor Hammond, just want to give you a chance to jump in. I just want to, uh, uh, first of all, I just want to say thanks to, uh, thanks to our, 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 our uh, panel of experts. Uh, your, your comments and your questions were fantastic. Uh, uh, and then uh, absolutely uh, thanks to everybody who came here uh, today to, uh, to see this. But more so uh, than anything else, I'm... Uh, I, I want to say thanks to the students. Uh, this class, every single year, this class um, uh, makes me prouder and prouder uh, of uh, of the of the kinds of interactions, the kinds of collaborations uh, that are uh, possible, and how our students embrace this. Uh, and um, I really think that this is a this is a place where um, you know it's possible. It's always possible for 
uh, people on the law side to forget about what the technological change could mean for them. And it's always possible for people on the computer science side for, uh, to, to forget how they can uh, impact and change the world. And actually, uh, they forget how to appreciate sometimes uh, the, the very people who, whose lives they are impacting. And uh, I think as I look at each of these teams, uh, the, the notion of what we can do and what we can do for, um, uh, we're, we're always front of mind. And uh, I'm, I'm super proud of this group. Uh, and uh, that, that's it, that's all I got. Uh, um, I'm, I'm impressed and I'm proud. And, uh, and you've, as once again, uh, this, uh, this class has made me incredibly happy. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah, I agree completely. I mean, it's really uh, great to see what the students have done. Very proud of what they've done. You, you, um, someone else I wanted to mention uh, briefly, uh, Sergio Cervantes is is here. You heard his name mentioned several times. He's a lawyer and a computer science PhD student who attended every class session. Uh, he was in the class actually last year. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio. Thank you so much for your contributions to the class. Uh, and 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 incredibly helpful with each team contributing to the teams. We really appreciate your contributions to the class as well. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Sergio. And I just again, thank you, Kunur, Irina, and Nick. Thank you for spending time with us. We really appreciate it. It was great comments, great conversation. Uh, thank you again to the project partners. As probably is pretty obvious. Uh, it's not like the project partners just handed us a problem and then, you know, let us go run off with that. They invested real time. They spent a lot of time working with our students, and it is just really greatly appreciated um, that they, they believe in what we're doing and, and support our students and work with our students. Uh, and then just again, thank you to, to the students for all the work that you did. Uh, we all know that working in teams is it's challenging. It's, it, it takes real work and investment. And so we really appreciate the teams. Uh, the student teams doing that, particularly as we've been going through this pandemic, right, and, and living in this hybrid world, uh, it's tough. Uh, but I think they all, lear everyone learned a lot, and uh, you know, this going being able to have the the final presentations like this, and and have this kind of gathering and bring everyone together uh, has been really satisfying. And thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us. We really appreciate it. Uh, we appreciate it, your participation in other law and technology initiative programs that we do. Uh, we're really excited to, to continue collaborating and hopefully we'll be having some more events in person this next uh, upcoming year uh, as well. And so we look forward to seeing you at those events. So that's it for the 2022 Innovation Lab. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening and take care. Bye. Great job, everyone. Bye. Okay. Bye. Thank you.